And I want to talk about Palestine and about the broader regional situation in keeping with our, our theme of Palestinian liberation in the uh, Middle East. The discussion that we've just heard now, I think, is a very good one, and it saved me a lot of work, because I think a fundamental point uh, that I wanted to make, but I think we've just heard it exposed very well, is that the, the, the whole notion of a two-state solution, uh, I think, has now faded into the past. Uh, I know people keep saying, time is running out. But time ran out a long time ago. Even if you uh, think, if, even if you thought that a two-state solution was possible, then uh, I think that that very few people still uh, accept that. But even the language you use when we say two-state solution, when you say solution, it begs the question of what is the problem that we're trying to solve. And I think that this is a moment where the problem is coming back into much sharper focus, and this, this has a lot of uh, implications, obviously, for what happens in Palestine, but also in how we uh, do our advocacy here in the United States. Uh, in the past, when I was growing up, uh, you would hear language in the media or in academic discussions about the Palestinian problem or the refugee problem. And, uh, this is very, uh, this is language that sometimes passes without uh, note. But if you talk about the Jewish problem or the black problem, all of a sudden people will take notice and say, well, what do you mean the Jewish problem? Jews aren't the problem. Uh, African Americans aren't the problem. The problem is bigotry. The problem is racism. The problem is the denial of the rights of uh, African Americans if we're talking about civil rights. The problem is anti-Semitism if we're talking about the persecution of Jewish people in Europe. And so we immediately understand this language to be uh, out of sync with our values. So there is no Palestinian problem. There is no refugee problem. Uh, those are problems that don't exist. The problem, and I think the discussion we just had <coughs> illuminated this, is something else. It is settler colonialism. It is uh, a, a, a doctrine that uh, says that one group of people has a right to rule. In other contexts, this has been called apartheid. Uh, it's been called Jim Crow. It's been called uh, settler colonialism. And all of those terms have their resonance in the context of Palestine. But fundamentally, in the context of Palestine, the problem is Zionism. And I think we have to be very uh, open and clear about saying that. Zionism is the problem. Not Jewish people, not Israelis, but Zionism, an ideology. Uh, a, a, an ideology and violent political practice uh, aimed to implement this ideology. And the ideology says, that Jews all over the world constitute a nation and that this nation has a right to self-determination in Palestine and that this self-determination must take the form of a state in which Jews have a majority so that they can exercise political, cultural, and economic control over the state. And that this is a fundamental right that cannot be questioned that it is, that is uh, called Israel's right to exist as a Jewish state. And I think uh, uh, in, uh, uh, we heard this discussion previously, but in, in my forthcoming book, the, the, the Battle for Justice in Palestine, um, I, I have a chapter called, Does Israel Have a Right to Exist as a Jewish State? And I will spare you the suspense, the answer is no. Because the right to exist as a Jewish state means in practice the right to discriminate against the indigenous people of Palestine by uh, first of all ratifying the ethnic cleansing of 1948, saying that Palestinians and their descendants who were forced out of their land in 1948 cannot come back. 
for one reason alone. It's not security. It's not because there's no room. It's not because of the difficulty of resolving property rights. All of those things would have uh, practical solutions if uh, we wanted to talk about them. But there's one reason why Palestinians aren't allowed to come back, and that is because they are not Jews. And that identifies the racist nature of Zionism. That um, 1.7 million people are caged into the Gaza Strip, cannot enter and leave, cannot go to study abroad, cannot uh, travel easily to get life-saving medical treatment. I know many people personally in that situation for one reason alone, because they're not Jews. If those 1.7 million people in Gaza or the millions more Palestinians living in refugee camps in Lebanon, in Syria, in Jordan, uh, all over the world, if they were Jews, Israel would welcome them back. It would pay for them to come back. And Israel sometimes, they say, well, there's nothing extraordinary about this. Many countries have laws which, you know, have some kind of right of return or law of return, and Israel's no different. We're a nation, we were established, and we're, we're, we're bringing back Jews. There's nothing wrong with that. They cite the example of Ireland. They say, well, you know, if there's anyone in this, in this room with Irish heritage, you might know that if you have one a grandparent born in Ireland, then you have a right to get uh, Irish citizenship. And once you have Irish citizenship, you can live anywhere in the 27-member EU. That's a tip some of you might want to uh, look into, because they have health care in most of those countries. Uh, and you don't have to go to a website for it. Um, but uh, th there's no analogy there to, uh, to, to Israel's so-called law of return, because the Irish law is not racist. It doesn't, they don't ask you, was your grandparent Catholic? Or was your grandparent, you know, Celtic? They don't care. Your grandparent could be Protestant, they could be African, they could be of Spanish uh, 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 descent. Uh, the, the, the Eamon de Valera, one of the, the longest serving presidents of de Valera, not a typically Irish name. His father was Cuban. So it's not a racist law. It's a law that says any person whose grandparent was born in Ireland uh, can uh, claim citizenship. So, uh, so, so Israel stands exceptional, uh, as an exception, the only state that, in the world, that grants citizenship based on, eth uh, I don't want to say religion, because it's not really religion. You can't just show up and say, I profess myself to be a Jew. Israel defines Judaism as a genetic condition. And so it's a kind of ethno-racial citizenship, and recently, you may have read that the Israeli uh, Supreme Court once again, this is a long-going legal battle that's been going on since the 1970s, once again denied to a group of Israeli citizens the right to be registered as having Israeli nationality. Can you imagine this? Israel is the only country on earth that does not recognize its own nationality. You cannot be registered in your passport or identity card or in the population registry as Israeli. You have to be assigned a racial category, Jewish, Arab, Druze, and so on and so forth. Why is this? It's fundamental. The Supreme Court said it, that if we recognize an Israeli nationality that is not differentiated in these racial terms, then all hell would break loose. All of a sudden, everybody would be getting access to land and to decent education instead of the current system where the best is reserved for Jews. Now, this is exactly like, in this aspect, not everything in Israel is like in apartheid South Africa, but this one is. 
And I, when I was in South Africa a few years ago and I visited the Apartheid Museum in Johannesburg, when you enter the museum, one of the first uh, experiences you go through is you see all these, they're enlarged, these identity cards of South Africans, you know, from the apartheid era, where you see the race recorded on the identity card. And the stories they tell is that, you know, the racial classifications determined everything about your life, but they determined uh, not just where you lived, but where you could work, but even if you could live with your family. And so the bureaucrats who, who registered someone, you know, they might register the rest of the family as white, but one person as colored. All of a sudden, they can't live together. So you'd have families petitioning to be reclassified, a white family trying to get itself classified as colored so it wouldn't live together, or a colored person reclass, and so on. So this is what these Israeli laws remind us of. When the state determines what your racial grouping is and then decides what rights you get based on that determination. It's the most anti-democratic thing you can imagine. And Israel's the only state that does that and also claims to be an exemplary democracy. So the problem is Zionism. None of this is necessary. I agree with a lot of the discussion we, that, that uh, we heard in the last session. It is possible to think about a, a decolonized society in which Jews, Palestinians, people of, of uh, whatever background, however they got there, can build a future based on equality, cultural uh, equality and diversity. Now, not everything in a culture has to be preserved. A lot of present-day Israeli culture is based on domination. That, that has to go. That part of the culture has to go. As the, the parts of American culture, the way of life that people wanted to preserve in Mississippi and Alabama had to go. And as whites in South Africa are still learning to uh, give up uh, uh, supremacist aspects of their culture and to build a new culture from elements that are non-discriminatory that can include, of course, language and uh, religion and traditions that are not uh, built on oppressing other people. I think that's entirely possible. And in uh, the book, I talk about uh, some of those issues from uh, Ireland after the Belfast Agreement and uh, in South Africa. I won't say <clears throat> much more about that now in the interest of time. So, but I think it's important to be able to understand that this supremacist ideology is what stands in the way of people living together. It's not that there are Jews in Palestine. It's not that Palestinians and Jews can't live together, that there's some kind of alien species that can't mix. That's historically not true, and it, it, it doesn't mesh with the best of human experience. Now, this focus on Zionism, which I think is, is coming back, or let's say I think Zionism is coming back into focus as the problem, although not everyone is comfortable talking about uh, Zionism openly as I think uh, we should. But it has some implications. Uh, the growth, I think our discussion today in a way has focused a lot on the role of states. And I think we have to bring the balance back in a sense to what people and civil society can do. And one of the, uh, I think, very positive developments in the past few years has been the growth of the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement in the United States and around the world. And I also spent, uh, I also write a lot about that. And I think it's had a tremendous impact in terms of changing the discourse uh, in, on college campuses in the United States, in churches, and really now starting to feed into the general culture. And the three basic demands of 
the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement that were expressed by Palestinians in the 2005 civil society call for boycott, divestment, and sanctions are the end of the occupation of the West Bank and Gaza Strip. That's something that already was a, a, a let's say, a high-profile demand. But also ending all forms of discrimination against Palestinians as citizens of Israel, and, of course, the right of return. So those second and third demands really challenge the basis of Zionism. They really run against the notion of a Jewish majority state maintained through racial ger gerrymandering and violence, and say, no, the rights of Palestinians, the rights of, hu the rights of Palestinians as humans not some kind of mystical tribal right of Palestinians as Palestinians, but the rights of Palestinians as human beings trump this claim that Zionism makes that Jews have a right to have a majority state in Palestine. Now, the implication that has for us here is that for a long time, when the movement, or let's say the focus of discussion, was focused only on a Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza Strip, it was the, the movement was a very comfortable place for people who might be described as liberal Zionists. Because liberal, now, really, the main argument for a two state solution is a Zionist argument that unless we get rid of a Zionist argument and a racist argument, let me be clear about that, that says, unless we get rid of all these Palestinians and give them a state, then there will be too many Palestinians and they will swamp the Jewish state. And if we give them the vote, then they will, of course, naturally not vote to keep giving Jews a monopoly on uh, power and wealth and privilege. So it's a racist and anti-democratic argument that I, I would make this analogy in American terms. That when uh, the civil rights movement emerged, if the, re if the liberal response had been, of course, liberals uh, resisted civil rights until it became inevitable and then they became the champions of civil rights. But there's no need to go into that now. But imagine the response had been, okay, you don't like Jim Crow, you don't like segregation, which by the way wasn't just in the South, it was all over the country, and Chicago where I live is still the most racially segregated city uh, in the country as a result of uh, that. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, so the response would have been, you don't like Jim Crow, you don't like segregation, okay, we will take uh, a part of Alabama, and we will declare it to be a, a Negro state. And all Negroes in the United States will have citizenship in the Negro state. And if they want to vote, that's great. They can vote there. Of course, everyone would have understood that to be a thoroughly racist uh, idea whose aim is to secure and legitimize white supremacy while denying the possibility of full citizenship to African Americans and redefining American citizenship as whiteness. And of course, that's exactly what South Africa tried to do in the 1970s when it set up the so-called Bantistans. And that's exactly what the two-state solution is today for Zionists, and they say it openly, that if Palestinians want to have a state and feel national pride, they can do it in their own little state. And some go even further, like Tsipi Livni, the current Israeli justice minister, which says not only would Palestinians already living in the West Bank and Gaza have citizenship in the Palestinian state, but we might also take away the citizenship of Palestinians who are now citizens of Israel and give them citizenship in the Palestinian state. So that Palestinians living in Israel, in their native land, 
say, for example, in Nazareth or Akka, would now become foreign residents with citizenship in another state. And how long would it be before the Israelis say, well, your time is up, we're canceling your residency card now, but look, you have a state over there. You can go there. This is what the two-state solution is now. So, that was a slight detour from the point I wanted to make, but I'll come back to it now. So the implications in this movement are that there is no possibility, those uh, who support this kind of two-state solution, groups like J Street, who are very open about it, who talk about Palestinians using the racist language of, of demographics, we're not on the same side. And that's okay. We don't have to pretend to be on the same side. We have to be very clear that this is a movement, if, if, if that's what we want to be part of, a movement for universal rights, a movement for Palestinian rights based on universal rights, a movement that is capable of being inclusive of everyone, a movement that doesn't abhor the idea of babies being born just because they're a different religion or from a different ethnic background. A movement that can imagine a future in which everybody can live together despite the enormous challenges of decolonization. That's what this, is, this movement is about. And it's anathema to liberal Zionism. Liberal Zionism is about separation. It's about maintaining privilege, and it's about cloaking it in the conceit that while uh, building an apartheid state, we are also liberal Democrats and deserve to be treated as wonderful progressive people. And I think the moment we're in, the death of the two-state paradigm takes away that cloak. And it, it's causing some friction sometimes in within this movement when people really have to lay their cards on the table and say, well, what are you for? Are you actually for universal rights or are you using, your, using uh, opposition to the occupation and calls for a Palestinian statehood actually to cloak an agenda that is racist? So that, that's an important point I want to make is that we can't be afraid of that discussion and I think it's fine to have it, it's fine to disagree about these things. Um, I want to talk about the broader regional context, and some of that has already been touched on in, um, in the discussion that, that, uh, that we had. That uh, back in early 2011, when the first stirrings of what uh, have, have been called the Arab uprisings or revolutions began, I think people had a great deal of hope. And when you fast forward to today, a lot of that hope has been dashed for reasons that I think are well known, which uh, of course uh, includes not least the, the horrifying uh, civil war in Syria, where uh, now more than uh, uh, several million people, I think one of the speakers before said two million, but I think it's more than two million people are refugees. Uh, and um, half of the Palestinians uh, in Syria, uh, according to UNRWA, the UN Agency for Palestine Refugees, there are 435,000 registered Syrian re uh, Palestinian refugees in Syria. Half of them have been displaced. So, you know, Palestinians are experiencing a new uh, catastrophe along with uh, millions of Syrians. And so this, this looks like a, a particularly a depressing picture. The, I think it's important to mention that whereas the United States government always says it's on the side of democracy, the actual practical experience, not just in the past three years in the Arab world, but also going back many decades in the world, uh, is uh, that the United States has never stood on the side of democracy anywhere. Uh, recently, the US just admitted, uh, the CIA just admitted its role in the 1953 coup uh, in 
uh, Iran. It took them 60 years, but uh, they finally uh, fessed up to what everyone knew. And this, this has been the experience everywhere else, which is that, the, the uh, and I think uh, President Obama articulated this very well in his last speech before the UN General Assembly a few weeks ago, where he, 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 he said very clearly that the US uh, interest in the region is to, is to maintain uh, US he hegemony, which includes just uh, continued uh, uh, maintaining stability so that the energy resources can flow, but also uh, continuing to play uh, a game where the United States aligns with the most reactionary and anti-democratic forces in the region, which of course includes Saudi Arabia. I wouldn't believe all the hype that, uh, about the US and Saudi Arabia uh, splitting up. There is a deep uh, crisis in that uh, relationship but that's a crisis to do with the uh, sort of rotting uh, foundations of the Saudi regime. But uh, the US and uh, Saudi Arabia still need each other. And uh, they have been working in tandem with what really can, uh, in what really can only be called a counter-revolution in the region. It began, of course, I mean, if we go back to the beginning of 2011, Tunisia took uh, the world by surprise. But when the protests spread to Egypt, the United States was determined not to allow, not to lose another domino. They were afraid of a domino effect. And of course, uh, again, it's ancient history and we have short memories in this country. But uh, who can forget Hillary Clinton proposing the first, the U.S. engineered that Mubarak appoint a vice president. That vice president was Omar Suleiman, uh, a torturer, the head of Egyptian intelligence who arguably is even worse than Mubarak. He was the American candidate to take over from Mubarak. Let's not forget that. Uh, the U.S. was not siding with uh, democracy. Um, then there was Libya, and I think the calculation in Libya was, was this. You know, we have to thank Chelsea Manning for revealing so much vital information. Uh, and uh, one of the uh, things I worked on uh, a couple of years ago was looking through the cables of the uh, U.S.-Libyan relationship in the final years of Qaddafi and how close the United States was to Qaddafi and how uh, the US was uh, desperately wooing him to try to bring him into AFRICOM. This is Obama's military command for, uh, for Africa. And uh, so they really saw Qaddafi as a potential pillar of American militarism in Africa. Once the protest spread to Libya and it looked like Qaddafi might go, the priority then was to do it quickly and not to have a prolonged period of instability. And this came at a time when European companies, French and Italian companies in particular, had just made uh, uh, multi-billion dollar investments in uh, Libyan uh, energy. And so they said, well, if, you know, their calculation was, we lost Ben Ali in Tunisia, we lost Mubarak in uh, Egypt, if Qaddafi is going to go, let's make it on our terms. And I'm convinced that's what the military intervention in Libya was about. Uh, of course, the war lasted longer than they expected, and the chaos in Libya is ongoing now, and that's another story. Um, finally, what we saw in Egypt in uh, July was a military coup. It was a, a military coup that uh, stalled the revolution. Uh, unfortunately, many of those who had been, many of the so-called liberals who had been on the side of the revolution uh, have now supported the military coup and have forgotten the atrocities committed by the police 
and the state security and the army in Egypt and are now singing the praises of a new dictator in ways that, you know, were really hard to imagine just two years ago with, with Sisi being cast, the, the, the Egyptian uh, military dictator effectively, Abdel Fattah Sisi, being lauded as a kind of superhero, literally billboards of him in superhero costumes and this kind of thing. And uh, all of this has been underpinned with a, uh, a narrative of demonizing the uh, former or the deposed president, Mohammed Morsi, and the Muslim Brotherhood. Now, I have never had any uh, 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 enthusiasm for the Muslim Brotherhood, to put it mildly. But I also don't buy the uh, wildly exaggerated narrative holding them responsible for every catastrophe in Egypt uh, over 12 months uh, as if there hadn't been 30 years of pillage of the state by Mubarak and his cronies and by the state security. And when, of course, during those 12 months, Morsi was not even in control of much of the state, that you had the deep state in Egypt working uh, against him. And that's not to excuse him for his own incompetence uh, and arrogance and so on. But if you, if, you take the, if, you, if you apply to Morsi the maximum blame that he can legitimately be given, it doesn't rise to the level of the exaggerated stories that have been uh, 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 told to uh, justify uh, the coup that happened. And of course, part of this uh, coup or, or part of the, the outcome has been the renewal of uh, the, uh, or let's say the, the rekindling of the love affair between the Egyptian elites and the Egyptian military and Israel. Now, uh, it hadn't been broken by Morsi, far from it but it has been rekindled with a warmth that, um, that, was, that Israel was afraid would be lost. And the primary victim, of course, has been Palestinians in Gaza, as we heard in one of the early sessions. <clears throat> but what's been so insidious, and we had a question about this uh, earlier today, about anti-Palestinian racist language that one young man heard in Jordan, uh, well, I have to say I, I'm, I'm not entirely surprised by that, but it's certainly less common than it would be in Egypt because you have the, the, the regime media and the Mubarak elite media uh, inciting now uh, 24 hours a day against Palestinians and Syrians, a kind of xenophobic incitement, blaming them for all the problems of Egypt in a really disgusting way an ugly way, but it's had an impact on many Egyptian people who actually believe the false stories that uh, uh, Hamas is sending grad missiles from Gaza in order to bomb Cairo. This has been all published in the Egyptian media, uh, well, well documented, that Hamas has sent thousands of fighters to uh, uh, Egypt in order to fight for the Muslim Brotherhood and so on. But the impact of this is that the siege on Gaza has been renewed with a brutality that is unprecedented. I was in Gaza in May, it was my first visit, and it was hard enough to get in then. That visit would be impossible today. And what friends are telling us from Gaza is that the situation has never been worse, and that the crushing of the tunnels, I actually went in the tunnels when I was in Gaza, I didn't get in through the tunnels, but we visited, and it was incredible. I mean, we went, we stood on a platform that was almost as big as this stage, but circular. You could park two cars on it, and then the, it was electrically operated. The platform went down a shaft of about 30 meters, and then at the bottom, there was a tunnel in front of you where they could bring cars through and bring a lot of goods. And what we could see, was that we could see it with our own eyes, that Gaza was absolutely dependent on these tunnels. You know, the media reports again say, oh, people are bringing iPads and KFC through the tunnels. Well, I don't know if that's true. Maybe, maybe it is. People in Gaza have a right to have iPads like anyone else. But what we actually saw with our own eyes was vast quantities 
of basic supplies coming in, truckload after truckload of gravel, of, of bricks, of uh, fuel, and so on and so forth, because Gaza still hasn't been rebuilt. And when Egypt crushed the tunnels, closed the tunnels, the true uh, impact of the Israeli siege has started to show now in uh, the really desperate economic uh, and humanitarian situation. So the regional situation looks rather dire, and it is. I think there's no uh, point sugarcoating it. But at the same time, I think that there's uh, reasons not to lose hope. I don't think that the coup regime in Egypt can last forever. I don't think even the $12 billion that came from Saudi Arabia can prop it up. The economic catastrophe in Egypt cannot be concealed. I think that Egypt is too great a country with too much history, with too many amazing people to be constantly worshipping this dictator or that dictator, and that the Egyptian people have taken a really unfortunate deviation from the difficult path of liberation and sovereignty and true independence, and they'll find their way back to it. I think that uh, there is a dawning recognition, although I'm not sure it's accompanied by the political will yet, that uh, the options in Syria are continued bloodshed which could continue for many more years. We saw the civil war in Lebanon lasted 15 years, but in Syria it's on a much bigger scale. So continued war or some kind of political process. And maybe we're edging towards that now. I hope for the sake of uh, people in Syria that there can be some kind of acceptable outcome that doesn't involve <coughs> prolonged war. In Palestine, I would say I'm almost opt more optimistic than anywhere else. That might sound strange when every day people are still being pushed off their land. But I truly believe that, I, that the battle of ideas, we've already won. We've already won the battle of ideas. Uh, and we, we have to have the self-confidence to demand what that entails, full rights for Palestinians, uh, and a process of decolonization that is inclusive of Israelis, that has a future for uh, Israeli Jews as citizens uh, in an equal state, not as settlers, not as supremacists in a so-called Jewish state. And I think in this country, I feel the climate is changing. I've been doing this work now for, it's hard for me to believe, uh, more than 20 years, and I have seen a change. Uh, while we're sitting here over in California, the National Students for Justice in Palestine conference, uh, the third conference is meeting, and I, I had the privilege of speaking at the conference last year that was uh, in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and this movement is truly amazing. And it's making really important connections that I don't think we have made sufficiently or deeply enough in the past, which is to understand that the system of the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the racial ideology that underpins what Israel is doing to Palestinians is the same as the racist and xenophobic and nativist ideology that has allowed Obama to deport almost two million people in the past four years. That has allowed this, and by the way, President Obama, you won't believe me when I tell you this, but you can check the figures yourself, has deported, uh, or it will be by next year on current projections, will have deported more people from this country than every previous American administration in the past hundred years combined. And this, this is accompanied by the increasing uh, militarization of the border, 
And uh, the, uh, you know, when you, tra when you travel to the border regions, I spent several months in West Texas earlier this year, and I'd been previously <coughs> to Arizona, you feel as if you're under occupation. And people there fe feel that. You can't drive a short distance without being stopped by the border patrol. And it's not just that, it's also uh, a, a nativist racial ideology where in Arizona, just like in Israel, Palestinians are now being prohibited from commemorating the Nakba, commemorating their ethnic cleansing. In Arizona, you have a law prohibiting uh, uh, ethnic studies, prohibiting teaching about the settler colonial history of Arizona and the southwestern United States. So the students for justice in Palestine are making those connections. They're making the connections to mass incarceration in this country. And these are connections that are not just about the racial ideology, but they're deep. I'll give you just one example. The company that incarcerates Palestinian children in Israeli detention centers called G4S, it's a British-Danish multinational, is the same company that runs uh, prisons, including juvenile prisons, all over the United States. So this is a movement that is also identifying who is profiting from these kinds of racialized forms of oppression and beginning to build joint strategies to resist. So that's why I'm extremely hopeful about uh, the future. I think what uh, we need to do, and I'll end with this, is to uh, really continue this discussion, not, not to let it end with a conference, but to make sure that we can find ways to keep these discussions going on campuses. One of the ways, of course, that students are doing that is through divestment initiatives that have taken uh, off and are really uh, going on all over the country now. But even if you're not ready to do a divestment initiative on your campus, to, to begin to work your way there by even just holding a debate on it. You don't even have to present a divestment resolution, but have a debate on it. Begin to bring the discussion forward and to tie it. Not, don't just make it about divestment from companies profiting from Israeli oppression, but does the University of Connecticut actually have a uh, social uh, and ethical investment strategy? Who are the other students and who are the other uh, issues that you can engage in building a, 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 an undefeatable movement to force institutions like this to be accountable and to end their complici complicity in oppression? So, let me stop there. I don't know, Adam, if we have time for q and I'm happy to, but it's up to you. Okay. And uh, thank you.